Hello, everybody. This is Tommy's Outdoors episode 27. And in this episode, we are going to talk about sailing. I'm quite happy with that because I always want to uh, record an episode about sailing. Uh, sailing is a very, um, what to say, important uh, outdoors activity. And talking about outdoors activities, which is what we do in this podcast, it would be incomplete if we not talk about sailing. And um, I probably couldn't imagine a better person to talk about sailing than my guest today in this episode of the podcast. It's enough to say that he's a first, uh, first guest that has his own Wikipedia page. So maybe I just quickly give you a, a rundown. Um, he has completed 10 round-the-world races, which includes four first-place finishes. He won Volvo Ocean Race uh, on board of uh, Group Ama in 2011. For, for ones of you who know uh, what Volvo Ocean Race is, I'm sure you're impressed and you're already expecting who that is. Uh, for ones who don't know what the Volvo Ocean Race is, we're going to talk about it in this episode of the podcast. He overall completed or, or attended in five Volvo Ocean Races. Uh, he set the world record uh, circumvention in 2004. Uh, he was described as Ireland's uh, national hero and top, ten, tom, top 10 sailor. Uh, and the list goes on and on. He's also uh, working a lot with, for uh, ocean conservation and na natural wildlife conservation. He worked as a recreation education manager for Canadian Wildlife Federation. Uh, he's promoting outdoors, outdoors education. And um, he's active promoter of ocean conservation. And that probably is an um, opportunity to have another episode on its own. Uh, and he's an ambassador for Sailors for the Sea. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Damien Foxo. Damien. Thank you very much for doing this. You're welcome. I, have, nice I, I appreciate that uh, you're, you're being here and, uh, and, and talking to me and uh, for our listeners. It's not very often that I get to do uh, interviews uh, in my hometown. So um, All it's, right. uh, it's All a right. nice change to be looking out here <laughs> of Ballinskellig's Bay and looking out to the Salig Rocks and talking about sailing around the world. So that's, uh, that's kind of nice. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So first of all, we are in, a, in an incredible room in a, in a local hotel with all the carpets and everything. It's, it's, it's perfect. Usually some sort of shabby studi studio. And um, secondly, like in, a, in the Tommy's Outdoors podcast, I always want to do the podcast about sailing. And, uh, you know, like who, 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 what the better person, all right? So you are a national hero. You're a Irish sailor of, of the year. Like you, you're just a legend of sailing, right? I, uh, well, you, if you say so, <laughs> I do, I do, I do, uh, Damien. So, so once again, thanks, thanks for doing that. And um, you're you're not only very much into sailing, you're also into sustainability and conservation. And and conservation is is another uh, subject that I quite often talk about in in Tommy's Outdoors podcast. This is kind of like a mission of the podcast as well to make people aware. So this is like it's going to be an exciting episode. Uh, just to kick things off, maybe maybe. Talk about a little bit of how you got into sailing and, and how, how that happens that, that someone become professional sailor. Okay, so, uh, yeah, Damien Foxall. I'm from uh, Bonavala, Cahardaniel, Killarney, County Kerry. So that's halfway around the Ring of Kerry for any, anyone, uh, any of the listeners who don't know where that is. Uh, so we're right out on the edge of the Ivora Peninsula. And I grew up here. Uh, basically, um, with my feet in the water, um, uh, with a, a, a small bit of farmland that went right down to the edge of the sea, and uh, we had a small fishing boat on a running mooring. Um, as a young fellow, I would have, you know, been out fishing, and the first bit of money I made, I bought my own windsurfer. Wow. Um, I think my father and mother bought a small sailing dinghy. And kind of, you know, so so the water was always in our blood, I suppose. So it was like natural for you, like, a, like yeah, I need to I need go out and... and, and <laughs> it, it wasn't even kind of like a choice. It was just, you know, it was part of what we are, you know, and our, you know, what we did, you know, whether it was all summer, the door was open once mm -hmm. the sun came up 
and we were just out messing around in the hills and on the coast and on the water and always very clear guidelines as to what was safe and what was not safe but um of course you know as a young as a young fellow you get out there and you know you kind of you discovered that yourself of course mm -hmm. as well and um it was an amazing way to grow up and and then coming home you know rummaging through the attic i'd have found old cardboard boxes of pewter trophies that would have been um, in fact, old, I, I, you know, what are these, you know, and, and they were actually granddad's trophies. So he was mm. a, a dinghy sailor, grew up in, um, lived in Liverpool and uh, he, my mum would have sailed with him. And so they had a small sailing dinghy, but apparently he was fairly successful. So there were loads of boxes of these trophies that he'd have won, uh, broken sailing knife and you know, old compasses and all the gear, you know. And mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it really kind of, um, you know, I sort of, Jesus, what's, you know, what's all this stuff? So, um, and then, you know, at, a, at an early age, um, Ozzy and Helen Wilson set up Derry Nancy Sports on the other side of the harbour. Mm -hmm. And of course, then that became the, you know, kind of aspiration for our inspiration, so to speak. And, you know, summer holidays, we'd, you know, we'd be over there working as windsurfing, sailing and water ski instructors wow. and, you know, dream, living the living the living the dream. Yeah. Um, I left school early and ended up um, after about a year doing a transatlantic delivery um, via the Canaries to the Caribbean and spent seven years working in the Caribbean. What do you and, mean delivery? Um, so um, basically as boats move around from one part of the, um, so, you know, from that, you know, from one part, from one country to another, um, the boats in this context would be delivered. Right. Um, so not necessarily cruised or, diff, you know, you're, you know, really choosing to get from, let's say, the Mediterranean mm -hmm. or the Portuguese coast to the Caribbean or mm -hmm. back again, depending on the season, uh, movement of these boats. And so they're always looking for, um, you know, good crew or crew and yeah. people that don't get seasick or whatever it is. So, so there's, um, um, so I, you know, kind of got on that caravan, ended mm -hmm. up getting off in the Caribbean. I lived and worked there for seven years. And it was mm -hmm. that time really when I realized that um, sailing was an industry right from the delivery of uh, of these boats um, for private owners or for companies, charter companies, mm -hmm. uh, right up through working on, you know, you know, private boats um, or, you know, racing. And, and ultimately, um, I saw, you know, I got involved in a lot more and a lot of racing over there. And that's where I realized that as kind of a fairly competitive person, that that's where I wanted to <laughs> focus my effort. And... Um, they kind you know, of woke that up in you. It did. Well, I, I suppose I was already competitive, but actually it gave me, um, it, it gave me uh, an output <clears> for that energy. And, and um, uh, you know, I, I would have spent a couple of years on the US side doing various races, mm -hmm. um, things like the Key West Race Week, Newport, Bermuda, um, maybe some of these races kind of ring a bell. And then around that time, I, I, was, I became aware of a, a circuit in France, which was a single-handed circuit called the Figaro. And uh, one of my kind of, I guess, sort of uh, peers at that stage, or actually maybe more someone actually who was kind of a, a bit of a guide, he said, you know, listen, that would be a great thing for you. You know, you've mm -hmm. got such an all around discipline and all around awareness. You know, you could really go do really well to go to that. And so the single handed campaign, offshore campaign, really, you have to put your own budget together, mm -hmm. look after the boat, the sailing and the racing of the boat requires all the range of skills, the navigation, the driving, this trimming of the sails. Yeah. Um, you have to understand how a boat, how and why a boat goes fast and how you can improve that. So it's a very all round discipline. And uh, it suited me really well. So I got involved with that for three years, uh, became the first non French person to win a leg of that race. Um, yeah. And uh, the first, I actually won the rookie <coughs> section on the first year, which carried amazingly a sponsorship for the following year. And like when, you know, the spon you know, the budget at the time was wasn't that much, but it was still like you know fifty thousand pounds or euros or what it was. You know, it's a lot of money, mm. right? But um, um, and so actually, I won that on the first year on the circuit. You know, was a sponsor and a boat for the following year. It was amazing, and that really um, launched it, launched me, I suppose, and. Um, three years of success there led me to racing on the um, French trimaran circuit, 60 mm -hmm. foot trimarans. And I still have to do better sailing than that mm -hmm. anywhere else. It was really, I just right place at the right time. Huh. And we were involved in Grand Prix round the boy races, transatlantic races, single, double and fully crewed. And, you know, just to describe what that is, these are 60 foot trimarans. They're 60 foot wide, 60 foot long 
we were doing speeds of over 30, 35 knots. Um, and when I say double handed, some of these races were just, you know, one, two, uh, one or two people, and so uh, is it, on is board. It like, like there, how does it work? Because there's there's a lot of a lot of like, are those boats set up to be to be to be sailed by <coughs> such a small crew? So so actually that was the interesting about that class was that they were both uh, there was a class and the circuit the annual kind of program of races was designed around a fully crewed setup of maybe five to seven people on board but also had a couple of events where there would be a double-handed to two people, uh, <laughs> transatlantic, for instance, or a single-handed race. And um, and so that was a cycle of events. That the typical cycle was a four-year cycle. Yeah. And so every year there would be at least one transatlantic. And you know every other year it would be either a single or a double-handed race. And then every four years there was the Quebec Saint-Malo, which was the fully crewed race from yeah. Canada to, to the north of France. And so that was the place to be um there were you know more than 15 boats 12 boats on the start line in some of these races when you say i mean 15 boats but you know 45 hulls because these are trimarans three yeah. hulls for each boat so it was an amazing place to be and around that time i really complimented my sailing with uh, getting back into dinghies i um did a an olympic program if you like so the aspiration was to you know see how we went against some of the professional uh you know our, our specifically skilled um uh olympic uh, olympic sailors and so i put together a tornado campaign so the tornado mm -hmm. was the olympic class catamaran at the time yes. and for about two years we uh we joined the olympic circuit and m th my objective was just basically to hone um, some specific skills yes. um, from the Olympic uh, campaign to um, increase my own overall broad set of skills. And so the amazing thing about sailing is that there's such a wide range of disciplines and cross training between these various disciplines as an athlete, you know, gives you such a broad base of experience and skills. And so something that you learn in a dinghy is whether it's driving and trimming a boat fast um, is directly applicable offshore. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, you know, so there's a lot of skill sets, uh, with re whether it's regards to endurance or energy management or, you know, uh, you know, weather preparation or whatever mm -hmm. it is that you can bring back to some of the other um, um, you know, smaller races as well. So um, it's an amazing sport, and yeah. it's uh, you know I've been involved in the sport now since uh, well since I you know since I was a kid from learning growing up here on the water. Yeah, I can do that. And um, I've done <laughs> been involved in ten round the world races, six Volvo Ocean races. Someone asked me the other day, <sighs> what does that represent in terms of miles? So I did a quick calculation, and so apparently I've sailed further than to the moon and back so uh, <laughs> if that was possible so so that's a lot of my sea miles obviously so and i'm just hoping that someone will give me another job one of these days yeah oh god this is this and and so do you feel like a do you feel like a volvo ocean race is like a like a top of the it's like a like a like a pinnacle or is it just like another different class and his he's you know specific a set of challenges so the volvo ocean race is the longest sport in any sport it's the it really is the, as you kind of suggested there's the pinnacle of offshore racing offshore crude racing so it's um nine months from start to finish typically eight nine or ten stopovers this year we started in um, well the 2017 18 edition which we've just finished here in june uh, we started in spain went through cape town asia australia south america north america to find, to end up in uh, in europe and so over those stopovers you combine points from one leg to the other and at the end of the day you know the there's other the and really you en mm. end up with the best team winning yeah. um and now when you think about the valve ocean race the best parallel that i can draw is a little bit like motorsport it's a technical mm. sport so you have the boat and the development and the technology and the engineering that goes into the development of that platform which is mm. going to be your you know, your racing tool, if you like, is hugely important. And so if you're not, you know, a lot of the result is already created, 80% of it is already created before you even get to the start so, line. So, so, on, so on that, so like recently, Volvo changed the spec of the boat from the open open class to the, it's like, I'm missing terminal, not, not the, like a spec 
class. So, so in the last two year, in the last two editions, we've been racing a one design boat, one had, design which, boat. Which, which which actually means that every boat was exactly the same. So actually, that notion of development really wasn't there. It was really more around the maintenance and um, and learning how to sail the boat. So. Uh, prior to that, um, and certainly for most of the races in editions leading up to the last, um, leading up to about five or six years ago, it was an open design boat, yes. which mas- basically meant that within certain parameters, you could really... You have um, a flexibility. You have a lot of flexibility and really required a lot of engineering and a lot of um, innovation to come up yeah. with the very fastest, most performant platform. Over the last two editions, they went to a one design fleet, which meant that um, the element of engineering and technology and development was taken away from the race and the emphasis was put on the athletes and basically everyone starts with the same machine and it's up to the athlete and the sailor to and the the technical team to maintain that boat and sail it as fast as possible. Um, It also means the one advantage of a one design fleet is that um, so for a boat to be fast, like a car to be fast, light is good, mm-hmm. heavy is typically bad. You know, gravity and inertia, um, rep, um, you know, basically represent themselves on the water in terms of the boats deeper in the water, which means more weighted more, surface area, yeah. more drag. And so the best thing you can do to make a boat go fast is to make it lighter. Um, and so that starts from the design phase. Now, uh, a light boat, however, means less material, less carbon. And basically, it doesn't necessarily mean you know. It typically means that the boat can be uh, can be you know maybe not necessarily it's as less strong. Dura- it's less it's durable. Less, less durable, and not as strong. That as was the, that was the problem with and the last <coughs> edition when there was an open. Because there were of, so many bra- breakages. breakages. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So so what they did. One of the advantages of one design is you can say, well, hold on a sec. Well, we'll just put an extra forty kilos of carbon on these boats, and to be, every boat, and, so and then <laughs> every boat will be more reliable. And so we've seen that in the last two editions of the race, most boats have finished the race. Um, Mm. There's been every leg, and there's been very few breakages, really. Um, and so that's the big advantage of, of one design. The disadvantage, on the other hand, of course, is that in the meantime, technolo- technology has moved on, mm-hmm. and some of the other classes are going, you know, I've just, you know, blown these, you know, yeah. the, 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 the platform of performance out of the water. And we got, we, we're now seeing monohulls mm-hmm. who are foiling. Literally, when we say foiling, it means that the, mm-hmm. a little bit like an, air wa- or an airplane wing, we're putting these foils into the water, and the boat lifts out of the water, which reduces that wetted surface area. Area. And now we're moving from the realm of 30 to 40 knots, 50 knots possibly. Um, 30 knots is, I think, almost 90 kilometers an hour. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's way faster than any, you know, double engine drape yeah. that you can drive out here. Um, one good example, actually, is a couple of years ago, we were setting the Round Ireland record. And as we came past the Skelligs, um, the local inshore rescue boat came out. And it was a fair bit of seaway for us. It wasn't mm-hmm. especially rough. Mm-hmm. But the lad said, just there was no way that we could keep up with you. We were going so fast. And no, we were going fast. We were doing like over 30 knots. But it mm-hmm. kind of puts into perspective. Yeah. Um, you know how you know you know how, what the potential of these boats yeah. is now, and so now we're shifting in the next Valve Ocean race from one design back to an open class. We're going back to an established class, which is called the Amoka Sixty, and these boats. And were, it's an open class. <coughs> it's an open class. Oh, good. And, and these boats were designed and are designed for th- uh, the the single handed round the world race, mm-hmm. and so they've been uh, in a development class for a long time, and they've got an amazing, you know, just an amazing. Uh, a range of technology and development which has been integrated in that class some of the um, some of the first innovations in sailing has come from that class whether it's canting keels or wing masts um, and all is to do with they come from a mocha class yeah a lot of them you know and so all of this is to do with increasing the power increasing the writing moment reducing the drag reducing the overall weight of the machines Mm. and um we're going to get to sail these for the first time, fully crewed around the world, and you know we're going to see a huge um, jump in yeah. in performance in these around the world boats um, uh, as part of the Volvo Ocean Race, and so that's really exciting. But then on the other hand, we're going to see more breakages. We're going to see you know it's going to be a lot more crash and because burn. Guys, and we'll we'll take a chances in the, in the constructing <coughs> the boat. We're going to well, save here. And I mean, now within the one design, there are safety um, uh, you know sort of safety nets and specific criteria. 
criteria which mm-hmm. have um you know it's not a free-for-all you know mm-hmm. so there's specific panel weights and um and design criteria that are integrated and building mm-hmm. you know into the build of the boat so it's um you know we're not just heading offshore with unseamen like yeah. vessels uh, but it's more about the way the fully crewed teams are going to be able to sail these boats a hundred percent of the a hundred percent a hundred percent of the time mm-hmm. and um uh, so that's really going to be exciting to see uh, it's going to be a whole new event and we're also the the event is also combined the previous class so the volvo 65 is still going to be there as a kind of an entry level fleet uh for teams with for new teams teams with uh, that, smaller that was what we were what we were talking earlier like to, to me it was like a, almost shocking because like you know the volvo Volvo, Volvo uh, Ocean 65. It was like in my head, it was like this, this top notch, you know, best boat ever. And I was like, no, no, it's just an entry class. So, so that's a shift. <laughs> well, I mean, we we will see. You know, the you know, absolutely, we're going to see two boats, two fleets on the water. Mm. One is, and you know, this is still to be formally announced, but I think you know what we're going to probably see is is two fleets on the water, the yeah. Volvo 65, and and then a development class. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I I I felt like when they announced the this the the spec class, not the open class. I, f- I felt bad about it. I felt like something was lost. I actually, and I, I totally get it that, you know, the team that has a, a load, loads of money uh, can put in more boats, more uh, research and development in the boat, and it's a better, better boat that performs better, not necessarily, you know, better crew. So I get that aspect. But somehow I enjoyed the, the, that aspect of, of, you know, I'm an engineer. So as an engineer, I was enjoying like, okay, these boats are like, the, that actually matters. That boat can be faster while, it, you know, that aspect was lost. Like, well, no, actually none of these is faster. It's only, so I understand it, but I thought like the well, I think that, you know, that, was lost. I mean, it's, I think it's really important to have um, step back into, um, to, to bring back in a new class, to step up the performance of the boats, to catch up to the existing technology. And, mm the development aft- aspect of our sport is hugely important. So that's really exciting, certainly from the technical team side. What it does mean is that we are no longer going to be able to jump in the boats three months before the start of the race and still mm-hmm. aspire to win or perform at the top level. Mm-hmm. Uh, the teams, the best teams are going to have to get back on the water now, next mm-hmm. year. Um, and the best teams, the teams that will win the next Volvo Ocean Race will probably start sailing in 2019 certainly by 2020 yeah. uh, the for the next race which starts i believe 2021 so yeah. it's going to mean uh bigger budgets the boats will ha- and the teams will have to be working and on the water a lot earlier to get up the curve quickly uh, one of the most important things about the Volvo ocean race is not just the performance of the team and when i say performance i mean the technological mm-hmm. development and uh, improvements that you bring to the f- to the boat and the way you sail the boat on the mm. water, but actually you have to start that process before, well before the start of the race, and then continue that progression right throughout the start of the, uh, right throughout the race. And the best teams are typically the teams that continue that progression curve even after the first start, after the first leg, yes. and continue that through the f- this the following months, right through to the end of the race. And and you know, there's a lot of improvements. Even in the last in the last one design fleet, there were improvements that were being made um, you know, right through the legs. And yeah. uh, you know, certain things like um, you know, dropping the keel mm-hmm. uh, when the boats were reaching very fast because actually the keel the keel itself was creating right uh, was was creating lift, mm-hmm. which uh, when you were hard reaching actually reduced the writing moment. So <laughs> it sort of went against the uh, your uh, you know the it sort of what was possibly you know kind of really ob- logical if you like, which was to put the keel up max 45 degrees gives mm-hmm. you more riding moment yes but when the boat starts going fast that keel fin starts to yeah. take off like an airplane and is reducing your healing yeah. and reducing your riding moment so <laughs> um so there was a lot of nuances which were learned by the yeah. fleet and by the boats as they raced around the world and the boats and the teams that didn't pick up on that quick enough uh were dropping off the uh, off the results table yeah listen so so this is like um you already you already said that uh, you know sailing definitely is a sport and i was wondering like it's probably more more than just a sport you know what what's your like a, like a, like a quick thought on you know i don't know maybe it's a part romantic part of me but like when i see those boats with all the stickers of all the sponsors like is uh, like 
is is like what's your what's your thoughts on that is like you know i like to me sailing is not a sport i wouldn't like this to be a sport in a sense like you know football or something like a sport sport because of the connection with the element and with the sea and with the with the air and like i mean like when you guys are out there at the sea no one no one cares about the sticker on there like and and i get it there's a cameras and there's a video and everything else like but do you think that there's like a extra element to sailing than just the sport that the sport is just a part of of you know sure no i mean we're very privileged to be um to be a sport uh team sport in our context generally speaking because uh we've got the whole shore side with 20 people who are working to get the boat on the water in the in the most performance uh setup possible and then actually the group of sailors that heads off and uh, so a bit like a, a pit team in formula one and then the driver mm -hmm. who heads off into out onto the track it's a very si similar setup except that in our context it's a, a context on the water and on the on the track it's a team sport mm -hmm. and then um so out on the out in the water it's really a little bit more like a football team because the team has to uh, operate in a very coordinated way mm -hmm. um that there kind of the similar similarities are left behind because uh, then maybe it's a little bit more like you know uh, maybe a more of a outdoor adventure sport you know well, hiking or climbing where you're exactly. linked with the elements um you're not you're you, there's a whole realm of of you know weather patterns and the, you know the, the the race course that race track is not a track that you control you know and of course yeah. you know when you're in your car driving around the track okay it's a little wet or dry and you might change your tires yeah but that's that you know and you know the corners stops. and all and that you know the corners and all that right but when you're out on the on the water you know it's just you know, every single second, every minute conditions are changing. Yeah. And now with technology, we can, and good weather forecasting, we can try to I integrate what those weather patterns will, you know, how they're going to change. We can, um, we can plot our, we can plot our route ahead of time mm. and try to, uh, mm. uh, try to set ourselves up strategically for what mm. the weather looks like coming forward and where our competitors are. And then there's a whole connection with nature, which, uh, a little bit more like mountain climbing, yes, uh, or you know, you know, some of the adventure sports is something that's very particular to sailing, and so I don't think there's one sailor out there who mm -hmm. doesn't appreciate this connection with nature, and it's certainly inherent within all of us to consider that this opportunity and privilege that we have is also carries with it a responsibility, and so that responsibility is even more and more important these yeah. days when we look at uh, issues around like climate change and ocean pollution. And, <laughs> it, you know, we have a, an amazing opportunity to, to experience nature and the ocean in a typically in a fairly pristine way. And so yeah. people ask me, oh, yeah, you see a lot more ocean plastic out there. And we do, you know, I, I don't want to say we don't, but you know, to be honest, I always say, listen, if you want to see ocean plastic and ocean pollution, you don't have to go to sea. The best place to see it is on the shore on any beach. And so mm -hmm. when I grew up, um, mm -hmm. you know, this would be 40 years ago, walking from Derry, uh, from Bale Tra to Derry Nan, and there's a small cove between these two uh, bays, which was called Ishgaroon, but we used to call it Plastic Beach. And it was just one of those natural collection points um, and so just so much macro plastic, big bottles of plastic, yeah. and boys and fishing gear on this beach. And so that's been around for a long, long time. This is not new. It's just is accumulating. And so if you want to see ocean plastic, you don't need to go to see the sea. Go to the beach. Uh, mm -hmm. What we do have out there is typically we get to see the sea in the, and the ocean in its, in its very, at its very best. And we see amazing sights, you know, albatross down in mm. the Southern Ocean, lost islands that might have been uh, visited once, the Kerguelens or Gok Island that appear out of the mist in the Southern Ocean, mm. icebergs and <laughs> the world in its very pristine, raw well, like, way. And so these images and that experience is something that I think we need to share with people who don't get to see that. And even just living here in the West Coast mm -hmm. of Ireland, you know, typically, apart from the odd beach which has got a bit of pl ocean plastic on it, we're seeing the you know the you know so the nature in its raw natural and pristine way you know yeah. really every day we get up it's beautiful and something amazing to look at but it's you know and, and for us it's normal but it's no but it is unique 
And there are very few people now, you know, the actually percentage of the world's population that has access to this type of experience is becoming smaller and smaller. And so for most people, um, you know, for, for us, this is a baseline. This is what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. But for yeah. most people, this their baselines are way, way different. You know, they're yeah. in urban environments. They're in environments where a polluted beach is the norm. And it's so normal that there's no even initiative to consider that we need to do something about it. So this is where we have an amazing opportunity to reset people's uh, notion of what normal is. Yeah. Um, and normal is seeing a beautiful sunset, a clean beach, um, growing trees, um, you know, maybe communities living in harmony with the environment. Mm. And, you know, urban environments are important as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's important to maintain a context of what the natural world yeah. can and should look like. And so that's that's the advantage that people who are out in the natural world or on the ocean have. And, um, you know, we have the amazing advantage now through our sport and through the storytelling power that our sport gives us because of our sponsors, supporters, partners, yeah. event managers, um, con you know, um, cities that want to have these events, these big events, coming into their uh, coming into their communities to tell the story of the of the race. But we've got other, much more important stories to tell as well. And so yeah. uh, that was a huge part of the last fall of ocean race, where we're racing around the world with the very best, you know. Uh, athletes, uh, sailing athletes from around the world is the first time that mm. um, women were integrated system systemically throughout the whole fleet. Uh, there was one f uh, one of the boats actually had a fifty fifty split between male and female mm -hmm. on board. I I think and that the, the earlier edition was also all female. The, well, uh, there was an crew. all female team on the previous edition, what, what, uh, but that was uh, but that was specifically a female boat. It's slightly different. In, yeah, in I got, this, got in it. this race. It was All like a mixed boats crew. Had a, you know, had a mixed crew. And, and so that's a, a very significant, um, you know, uh, development. And so, you know, where we've got this iconic world event, which actually in 2000 and 2017, 18 was the second most important sporting event in the world in terms of fan base. So wow. not just thousands or hundreds of thousands, millions of people but around this is the world because, But this, is it because this. it's nine months? Because it's nine months, of course, yes, that's one of the main, it's an international event going to pretty much all the continents, 10 stopovers around the world. So it's got a huge fan base. And so where, you know, when you think that 75% of people in North America follow sport and only less than 20% follow, follow science, if we can use our sport to bring across a scientific message, message. like climate change, ocean plastic, now, you know, we're, yeah. we're, it's hugely powerful. And so uh, sustainability was integrated within the last event, uh, not as a sort of a tick box at the end, but really as an integrated, um, w an integrated way of uh, the way the whole race uh, races run from the operations to the communications. Yeah, it was throughout. Legacy. It was it was themed throughout throughout the race. Throughout the race is the event, and then our own team. So Vestas Eleventh hmm. Hour Racing, Vestas Denmark. Um, sorry, Danish uh, Wind. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, wind, renew, farms. Re wind farms and renewable energy, and Eleventh Hour Racing from the Schmidt Ocean uh, Family Foundation, and uh, basically they promote ocean conservation through mm -hmm. uh, through sport and on this philosophy that if we can reach out to people yeah. where they're at then uh, and talk about sustainability and ocean conservation right, well. in the way that they they understand so um that was the and of course you know one of our main our one of our main objectives was to be was to win the race was to be as performant as we can on the water but at the same time without compromise to um, into you know to integrate and to and relay the to message relate of, this message of ocean conservation. Yeah, I was I was like that was unexpected where you when the answer to that that question kind of took us because I was more uh, you know referring to the old days of the Withbread uh, where you know there was no like a big sponsorship around that but you're right there was like an element missing there because very few people heard about Withbread racing because it was like completely different it was like well, a I pure. Mean, Sailing to the very close group of people who even knew that anything like yeah, that. I mean, was the, going you on. know, the the uh, the uh, ri origins of the Volvo Ocean Race and now the Ocean Race because Volvo have left um, as primary sponsor, but will certainly re uh, ma maintain uh, some sort of partnership or contact with the race. I'd imagine, um, but the origins of the race are the Whitbread Round the World Race and. 
they go back to the kind of Corinthian days of uh, you know, of a couple of friends in the bar putting together, oh, well, let's enter the boat, you know, this round the world race. And, and uh, it was very much a yacht club affair, um, a fairly exclusive yeah. affair, even though, and to be honest, most of the sailors and, and teams that put on the mm -hmm. water would have been, you know, very, um, you know, from, a, you know, wide ranges of, uh, of walks of life and, and uh, possibly not what people would consider as a yacht club sailor. Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of hard, tough sailors out there, and uh, oh. they've competed in the in the Whitbread around the, around the world race. And then over a period of of years, which just coincided with my kind of growing from a child to a young uh, a young sailor and a young mm -hmm. man just in the right place at the right time as the sport was becoming a professional, yeah. uh, marketable and, you know, a, a valuable sport yeah. uh, platform for, uh, for, uh, for companies to get involved with. And so when you look at sailing now, it's got a wide range of disciplines from mm -hmm. something like the Olympics. And we see people like Annalise Murphy, Murphy and some of our other Irish athletes doing very well in the, in the, in the, um, in the Olympic cl classes, um, right up through a wide range of classes, right up to things like the Volvo ocean race. Sure. And, um, there's a, you know, there's a range of disciplines and there's a range of products and events out there that, that suit athletes, companies, um, clubs, organizers yeah. to get involved with, whether it's a local event, um, maybe out of Phoenix. I think you're in Phoenix, mm -hmm. just outside of the Trillies. So Phoenix Sailing Club is a is a, is a wonderful club, uh, which is very dynamic, and they got mm -hmm. a lot going on. Um, right up to national events like Cork Week, uh, mm -hmm. like some of the. Uh, I mean, there's I think five, six clubs around uh, Dublin Bay and Dunleary. One of the most active parts of sailing, not only in Ireland and Europe, but actually in the world. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of Irish sailors and you know would be familiar with that, but a lot of Irish people would be, uh, you know, that would be a surprise, you know. So yeah. you know Dublin Bay and the sailing then around there is uh, it's one of the busiest, uh, busiest uh, mm. you know areas in Europe. And in um, Europe. Wow. In Europe, in the world, absolutely, wow. yeah, and wow. um, and then right up through to events like the Sydney Hobart, the Fastnet mm -hmm. race, um, transatlantic races, and the Volvo yeah. race. Yeah. So, um, yeah, good. Listen, um, I heard a uh, one time someone referred to Tour de France as the toughest athletic event ever, and my immediate thought was like, how is it toughest? It can't be. Uh, and the Volvo Ocean Race was what immediately jumped. Like I mean, like okay, granted, it's pretty pretty tough. It goes for three weeks, but these guys are you know after the race they're getting massage and they're getting sleeping in the hotel, they're getting in shower, getting in the hotel, and uh, well, and the Volvo, you guys are grinding it for weeks in the end, right? I there's mean, no I, I don't want to. there's there's no yeah. sleep. So so I was just wondering like, like how like when you're preparing to to all that like this is like a like a athletic camp where you're are you is the preparations the lead up to the to the race already taxing on the body or is it like just growing up and you know kind well, of i mean we, t it depends really as to how early before the race you start preparing your team um as athletes and sailors everyone will be running a program which is probably a cycle of various events throughout the year leading up to a key event whether it's the olympics or mm -hmm. whether it's something like um the uh you know, it might be just cork week or you know an event in up in dublin or yeah or, uh, it might be a world championships or it might be the the valve ocean race and so yeah. just like any other sport we'll be using our minor events and our minor training um camps to yeah. prepare for a bigger a medium event and then a bigger event and so when you think about the valve ocean race you know we're honing ourselves to be ready for that on the cycle that is happening and well, and so okay. the very best you know so as an athlete you expect to arrive there as fit and as strong and as prepared as you can for that event mm -hmm. and once the event starts it's really hard to maintain top physical form during the Volvo Ocean Race because it's if you can imagine doing a transatlantic how challenging that would be on the mind and body the Volvo Ocean Race is like doing 10 it's transatlantic it's, it's incredible and so it's like, you have never time at the stopovers to recover before the next leg. And so you kind of go through a slow, secular, degenerative mm. process of mind and body so that you start as a kind of a world-class honed athlete at the start of the Volvo Ocean Race and you finish as a kind of battered old sea dog on the last 
leg mm. and and that you know there's no way of 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 you know really kind of you know halting that is you can just you can just it's all about maintenance and it's not just about maintenance of your as yourself as an athlete but as the team as a whole both yes. on board uh, you cannot allow the psychological the content uh, perspective and you know within the short team so everyone has to pull together towards this one focus and uh, of performing and um, to the best of our ability whatever is thrown at you and so when you think about sailing and motorsport first thing that things that comes springs to mind is you know it, there's a lot of technical stuff that happens out there breakages and you know breakdowns are a part of the sport and you never yeah. know when that's going to happen one thing's for sure though it's going to be an upset it's going to be a big disappointment and the team <laughs> that gets over that hump in the best way from a motivational psychological standpoint for the team or from a technical standpoint how quickly can we get the boat back on the water mitigate or you know limit and then mitigate that damage that's uh, you know that's huge part of the sport yeah yeah, yeah. i was i was wondering uh damien about the uh sleep deprivation knowing knowing how and and this is this is interesting because knowing how how bad sleep deprivation is on performance like a performance physical performance and mental performance and at the same time the the conditions that that you guys are you know sleeping or not sleeping is like is is like probably constant you know building sleep deprivation is that something that uh, i don't know any techniques anything like would would you feel like like the crew would perform well, I think that's a, I'm saying the obvious. A crew would perform much better if they had a, like a proper sleep, and Not or sure. is it just a part of the sport and it's built in and it's, it is what it is? Um, all of the above. I guess uh, I, it's not something you can. It's certainly not something you can train for. Um, however, a fit body requires less less energy to uh, to do to do the same amount of work. If I've got to lift ten kilos, mm -hmm. if I'm fit, it's only going to take so many calories to achieve that work if i'm unfit it'll take more if so if it's if i'm unfit if it's going to take more calories i need more rest mm. okay so uh we, we do need to be as fit as possible um then the actual way that we set up our watch systems you know they're typically four on four off um and we do a rolling watch so that um every two hours two one or two new people come up on deck uh you're in your off watch You've typically two hours on standby. If you're lucky, you get to look after yourself in terms of uh, changing clothes or maybe uh, you know eating or getting a little bit of sleep. And then you're hopefully guaranteed the last two hours to get some sleep before you go back on watch. Two watching. hours. But you know, two, two hours. hours every eight. Um, is three eights, uh, three eights in a twenty-four hour period. So three by two is six hours, right? So if you're lucky, you get six hours, maybe less. It's already not too bad, you know. So the human body is not designed for monophasic sleep you know cavemen didn't go to bed at you know 10 o'clock at night and get mm. up at six or uh, you know seven or eight in the morning they mm. woke up at midnight to go for a piss and then check out there were no wolves outside the cave and then they went back to sleep again and they might have done that a couple of times you know so mm. and they might, probably they probably had a siesta and um yeah and and so you know our bodies are used to a watch system it's just that you know modern okay. life has pushed us into monophasic sleep you know sorry sorry i say monophasic but you know kind of mono block sleep yeah right? yeah um so you know the latin siesta is mm -hmm. you know is not that far off a watch system so the body adapts what we do have a challenge is when okay. you're um you know as a, a watch system you have to get up at this time and when you get woken up in the middle of your so you got your sleep is four phases yes and when you get woken up, ha not having completed uh, sleep phase, uh, you get a little challenge. It's a little yeah. like uh, going for a siesta, and you I love up. how you call it a little challenge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you wake up and it's that fit like three hours, and you're feeling great. Mm. And the next day, you wake up after a siesta for whatever reason, because the car beeped outside or whatever, and you're feeling like. Mm. You know, and it's just mm -hmm. like you know, it feels worse than when you went to sleep. It, the only reason that you have recovered. But just it's, you've been woken up in the middle of you haven't yeah. completed your phase. So, yep. um, so you yep. know, as part of a regular watch system, after a few days, your body adapts and your body shifts so that it does complete those cycles. And, you know, so, but at the end of the day, we have to live and sleep by the and do run our watch systems by the boat. 
So yeah. when we're tacking or jibing, when the boat needs to change sails, we adapt to the vessel. And if that means that we have to run for 24 hours with very little or no sleep, we do. If, on the other hand, we're in the trade winds or there's very little happening, uh, we might have good old you're blocks just, of sleep, just, you know. Just, um, just now, it, it does mean that when you come to shore, uh, quite often what happens is you do a lot of dreaming. You do, mm -hmm. uh, you fall into those deep uh, yes. recovery cycles. Your of brain sleep. tries to kind of get back. It that, recovers. Mm -hmm. It recovers. It's mm -hmm. trying to recover those cycles of sleep that it's been missing. You know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, and takes a couple of days. This is amazing because you guys are racing those boats like a nonstop for for weeks. This is think, this is this I is think amazing. One of, the, one of the one of the things you know, I don't you know, again. I suggest that I don't think you can train for this, but I think what you can do is train for being able to make decision uh, decision um, you know the sort of decision pro process and working with your colleagues and managing your energy under those conditions and so yeah. you can train for that yeah um, and so understanding where the alarm bells are you know mm -hmm. you know when you start nodding off or when you feel like you're about to snap at someone mm -hmm. or uh, you know you haven't brushed your teeth in two days mm -hmm. or Whatever it is, you know, you're you're you get up on deck, and you know, there are lots of little alarm bells, which means that you kind of go, okay, hold on a sec. I need to take Am care okay? of myself. I need to, mm. I need to double check. And so, you know, you you, you know, you, you, skipper and navigator typically work very closely together. So they might be both running fairly similar watch systems, but they're both really heavily and primarily involved in the decision-making process, like a pilot and a co-pilot on an airplane. And it's designed exactly the same way. So on an airplane, um, there, were, there were companies, um, there were uh, less so now, but there were companies in the past which had a, a, an unusual rate of incidents. And so mm -hmm. when they looked at, uh, when, the, when the aeronautical industry looked at some of those incidents and accidents, they were understanding, you know, why were these happening? And what they found was a lot of the time there was a breakdown between the relationship between the co-pilot and the uh. pilot. The pilot was kind of operating as some sort of um, kind of dictator from for cultural reasons or whatever it was yes. and the co-pilot wasn't fulfilling correctly his role as he should be as an equal who because was he couldn't because you know for you know for whatever and, and so um we have a similar setup on the boat um mm -hmm. whereby the the skipper is ultimately responsible for the overall decision the navigator might be very specialized as a, a very specialized uh, performant navigator analyzing the weather and he would probably recommend maybe even make decisions with regards to where the boat goes the skipper makes the final decision and manages the overall operations on board mm. but they both work together as um, a double check one yes. for the other and so um, you know that's another you know a sort of element of how we work on board and being able to run those processes under duress under sleep depra deprivation is very important and similarly on on deck mm -hmm. you know so you know when you see your you know your buddies and they're on watch but they're sleeping kind of holding on to the yeah, main yeah, sheet yeah, 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 yeah. and it's pretty windy you go okay oh, just you know john why don't you go down get a coffee um uh -huh. a change of clothes and um you know we're off in half an hour stay down there just to uh -huh. give you a shout if we need something uh -huh. um or you know might you might just you know you see someone who's skipped a couple of watches because uh -huh. he's been up for a few sale changes and it's oh, we'll, we'll just let him sleep through a little yeah. bit more um or on the contrary you know when you're going down and you know things are going to be tricky on deck you might stay in your foul weather gear because they're going to need you up yes. on deck and so the, hmm. being able to you know someone suggested that i think there's a study done on this in terms of cortisone and stress levels yes that offshore sailing and racing in in some in hard conditions is similar to men at war <laughs> of course they're two different totally different i'm contexts, not surprised i'm not surprised one is desirable and the other one is not right but but the it just kind of gives a bit of context as to yes. the type of stress levels and the and the interesting parallel there oh, is because not just the level of stress but the duration so mm -hmm. when we think of other sports you got stress high levels of stress a basketball game for instance or american mm -hmm. football or rugby mm -hmm. or you know whatever it is far 
45 minutes, 90 minutes. It's nothing. Maybe a little bad. longer, you know. Um, whereas, and then you get to recover, right? So, uh, but obviously, men at war, people doing long expeditions across the Antarctic or up Everest or whatever it is, and offshore sailing have uh, similar um, challenges around the duration yeah. um, of uh, of stress and, you know, sort of... Um, uh, and the issues that can go right with it, yeah. isn't that for one second i, I just want to uh, go away a little bit from from volvo ocean just ask you about the world uh, circum circumference uh, this is one of the things that that struck me about sailing that some time ago i thought about sailing like you know it's like a kind of old way of doing things because we have a you know power you know power boats and all that and so on But then I read somewhere that the fastest world circumference is actually sailing boat, and that the that the 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 the, the power boat, the, the engine powered boats can can't even get close. Even they are moving faster than the time needed to take the fuel. It's like this. This is this is amazing. No, I mean, you know, and the, the I can't remember actually what the actual record is now. I think it's in the forty something days. You actually broke the record. I did. It? We we broke it with Steve Fossett. Uh, R.I.P. because he passed away a few years ago in a plane accident. But Steve Fawcett was a gentleman who uh, held an amazing array of uh, records in various disciplines, sailing, mm -hmm. balloons, balloons, gliding. Yeah. And um, he, he, um, he set up a team, bought a boat, Uh, had a manager and wanted to break the outright round the world record and we ended up doing that after a couple of attempts and so that was way back in 2000 and something and I think the record we set the record at the time at 58 days so mm. 58 days is less than two months to sail all the way around the world uh, we were sailing on a 130 foot catamaran mm -hmm. capable of well over 35 40 knots but in big seaways so you know And the advantage, you know, we don't have to stop to refuel. Well, uh, this um, is it. This, and, is, and, this and, is the advantage. And, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, when you have the, the right planet is powering the, the yeah. The, you know, the, when you have the right conditions, um, sailboats can go really fast. You know, was, and, and so amazing. yes, power boats out there can um, can achieve similar speeds. But um, the advantage, of course, for a sailboat is that uh, we don't have to carry yeah. that all. all If that they fuel put all that fuel on board, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be doing those speeds anymore. <laughs> exactly <laughs> listen uh you've been not fortunate because you you've been on the boat that dismasted twice mm. during volvo ocean race except the one time you actually won that was with groupama and then the second one i think that that costed you win with with dongfong Do you you do you like to share any of your? Oh, sure. I mean, I was just, it like a, like a second time? Is like, oh, not again. Well, I mean, I I have to say, there's a kind of a bit of superstition that goes around with this, but you know, it's uh, uh, okay. It's um, when I think we, I, I've said from the outset that sailing is a technical sport, and breakages and breakdowns are part of the a part of the uh, a part of the sport, a part of the the. Um, a part of what we do and and how you manage those is a huge part of um your um your results and um and your successes and failures of course and so i've actually done i think 10 i think i said i've done and been involved in 10 round the world, world events and six volvos and so i've completed many volvos without um significant breakages but i've broken two mass the with group ama We broke a mast and ended up finishing that leg and ultimately ended up winning the race Exa overall. So, exactly. so the race that we, the following race with Dong Fung, uh, we broke a, a mast just before Cape Horn. And um, that was uh, in some ways lucky because it, we were able, we were close enough to actually limp into um, Ushuaia mm -hmm. in, um, in, um, down in the south of Chile. An amazing area, the type of place that as we motored through that night with uh, kind of with not only stump of a mast above our heads and having uh, unfortunately having had to cut away a lot of the broken rig so we didn't damage mm. the hull and um and put us in danger but at the end of the day we ended up motoring through the straits of magellan with glaciers and ice capped mountains around yeah. us and at that moment the kind of huge disappointment 
from as an athlete and as a sports person um, kind of dropped away from me and I suddenly realized, okay, the, the race right now is over, but the adventure starts. And so <laughs> when you, you know, when you come from this context it. here in Southwest Kerry, looking out at the Skelligs and the Bull Rock and on the tip of Ivara and looking out at the horizon as a young man going, you know, the world is your oyster and it is. Um, so at that moment, you know, the kind of the, the football had gone wide, it had missed the post and we we're going to lose that game. But the, the adventure was about to start oh, okay. and, and it was just an amazing experience to go into this, you know, kind of um, outlying town in the mm -hmm. very southern tip of South America where uh, they're outfitting boats to go to Antarctica. Um, Tom Crean and Shackleton would certainly have, have pulled in there. And these were names and places that I'd read about and wow. dreamed about. <laughs> and and here I was, you know, so it was like... So you wouldn't I, mind in the end. Well, you know... <laughs> Almost. Uh, you know, it's kind of, you feel guilty, but then, you know, it's kind of two personalities a little bit. But, um, you know, you suggested earlier on, of course, that our sport is more than a sport. And it is, a, you know, I think for any athlete in any sport, their sport is not just a sport, it's a way hopefully or possibly a way of living but it's certainly a lifestyle and it's yes. a lifestyle that you breathe eat and live 24 hours a day but our sport also brings this adventure nature connection mm. aspect to it as well which uh, which uh, there are very few, you know again it's a lot more like um, climbing mm -hmm. or expeditions where we're uh, we're really out there in the you know, yeah. out there in the wilds and you know to stop into some of these places when you come to shore whether it's having had a successful win or a less successful event you're uh, you're arriving in a totally different per with a totally different perspective into into harbor so you mm -hmm. know arriving into Galway from the ocean from the from the Atlantic across the Atlantic is totally different mm -hmm. to driving into it or coming <laughs> into southern Br Brazil Itajaí from the sea is totally different than flying in so oh, so it's uh it's uh, yeah that's an amazing perspective yeah. um yeah. yeah so I've had some uh, I've had a lot of wins I've had a lot of success I've had a lot of failures so funny enough you know when you ask me you know what are the kind of what are your high points uh, they're not necessarily always tight, always the wins you know sometimes yeah. you come in and you know uh, you've done your best and the team has performed amazingly but for whatever reason you haven't won yeah. sometimes you're that's more satisfying than maybe sometimes you win a race and yeah. you haven't sailed very well you, you got lucky at the last minute the other boats were sailing better but you know, just you the way it. the current and wind set up so you know or you know I don't know the feeling wasn't really good on board and um, but she won. Uh, you know, do you feel good about that? Well, not really. You know, mm -hmm. and there are other times where you know you might not even get a figure on the podium, but you had great crack, and yes. and you you can't wait to get back out to sea with the same team. And geez, you'll do better next time. You know, and and so you know, success isn't you know comes in different forms. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and uh, yeah. some of the best stories I've had. And some of the best successes are linked to results off the water, off the notice, off the, the results board. So yeah. with Ellen MacArthur, we were trying to do a Jules Verne attempt to set the round mm -hmm. world record. And we ended up breaking the, our mast in the Southern Ocean just off the Kerguelen's. Like we were pretty much as far as you can get from land in the, mm -hmm. in the, ocean, in the Indian Ocean, apart from the Kerguelen's, which were 100 miles to weather upwind from us. And the Kerguelen's are this um, French uh, uh, outcrop of mm -hmm. islands in the South Indian Ocean with um, Antarctic um, scientists uh, on the island mm -hmm. um, year in, year out. Um, and it was just going to be a long way for us to get all the way back upwind with this uh, jury rig and broken mm. boat. And we ended up s building a jury rig from the boom that was rem that remained well. on board and sailing the 3,000 or more miles to Australia. And it took us 10 days to get there. But the whole process and the whole story that went behind it, and we had a great storyteller from the BBC who was with us. And I can't remember, I think it was called Into the Eye of the Storm or something that he, he basically created this documentary around it. But it told this amazing story of kind of adversity and prevailing despite adversity and <laughs> um, the kind of the camaraderie on board. And so, you know, for me, that was one of the highlights uh, of, of my career, even though, you know, well, we didn't set a record we didn't, we didn't and we broke it, yeah. the mast and did kind of finished in... 
technical failure in some ways. Yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, the, the success was in overcoming that and the fact that many of us are still sailing and racing together. Yeah, yeah. So speaking about things that happened twice, uh, um, Vestas, like... I couldn't believe like Vestas had a they they they, they uh, run ashore the last edition of the, uh, the and I just uh, absolutely couldn't couldn't believe that it happened again this time around and this is like you mentioned superstitious and like I'm an engineer I deem myself not being superstitious but I say like, like how often it lightning, happened light, uh, how light, lightning doesn't strike well I mean I, th I yeah. think the, the association. Uh, is um, coincidental and certainly unfortunate. I mean, Vestas has been a very, um, uh, you know, a, a great partner for the for two teams now because it w they weren't the same team, and they had a yeah. So they were like they, a they sponsor had, only, right? They were, had a sponsor. They were a sponsor of a, a team in the previous race, um, and had an unfortunate incident in the Indian Ocean, which they overcame and came back to complete the race with the same boat. Uh, ended up going down there, getting the boat and equipment off the reef and getting the boat back in the yeah. race. And yeah. then they be, basically became a primary f uh, partner and a sponsor of our team in the last race. Yes. Um, and so... So sorry to interrupt you. This is like, this is like completely different because like from, from perspective of the casual fan like myself, is like, oh, that's the same team. Even I know there's like different people, different sailors, but it's the same... Only, there was only one person on board... Who, either on the shore side or uh -huh. on the sailing side who was on both yes yeah. so so in fact even though the title sponsor is the same it's like completely Absolutely. completely different yeah okay. so so that was the that was where the uh, um the kind of coincidence stops i guess um yeah. and then from our side this time you know yeah we had a we had a couple of incidents one quite big one two big ones uh the last one we broke a mast off the kergelens and ended up uh setting up a jury rig and delivering the boat to get back to the race in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was again, one of those points where, you know, this could be the end of the whole race for us. Um, but our, which one, which one was it now? No. So we broke the mass just off the Kerguelen, off the, sorry, off the Falklands um, on this last race. And um, we ended up creating a jury rig. On Vestas? Then, yes. How did I miss that? I know, I know that the, 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 so we actually broke mass three times. No, we didn't break the mass three times. Oh, no. So one was on Groupama. Yes. One was on Dongfang. Yes, and one was on Vestas. So three oh, times. I've broken other mast as well. All right. Okay. But we don't have all afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Capsized a couple of times. <laughs> you can't oh. sail around the world ten times into the moon oh, and back yeah, without some breakages, yeah, Thomas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, listen, tell me about the Canadian Wildlife uh, Organization. So You're involved in that as well. So I was. I worked for six years with the Canadian Canadian Wildlife Federation, and so they're a national NGO in Canada, which um, focus their efforts on conservation and education. And I worked for the education department. I do not anymore, but it was an amazing experience. It allowed me to link our sport, my sport, uh, with nature connection and you know, so we would have done a, lot, done a lot of work with youth groups the ymca scout mm -hmm. groups uh formal education as well and how do we get people how do we get youth how do we get adults how do we get young people learning in the outdoors or how do we get mm -hmm. outdoors uh, and learning out outdoor learning um into the school system and yeah. so that's becoming much more mainstream there still needs to be an awful lot of work done but you know when you think of and i will take a very specific example here because it's i think it's uh, uh most listeners will uh, relate to this here at home in ireland now um mm -hmm. you know i'm ultimately a blow-in here in southwest Kerry. um although i'm not sure if i'd still be considered that but you know um i certainly you know at home we wouldn't have had access to uh, spoken irish or gaelic but um certainly and you know, we grew up in a Gaeltacht area, but certainly, mm -hmm. you know, some of the older people around would have spoken it. And we all assimilated some words, you know, um, but I don't speak any more or less Gaelic than uh, than any of my local neighbours, whatever. Uh, I think for most of us, it's Gaelic is a, is a kind of a, is a is a challenge that we never really succeeded in 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 mastering. <laughs> now, you know, there are many of my the kids that I, I grew up with and friends that I see have an amazing command of the language, and it's fantastic, you know. And um, uh, and uh, you know, that's it, it's it's you know, I always kind of. It, it, for me, it'd be kind of one of my kind of acad academic failures, but I think it's a failure that most of us in Ireland have. And mm -hmm. so, when you think of 
we probably spent 10 to 12, maybe 15 years in school. We probably only did five or six subjects, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that we were doing one of those subjects, Irish, for two to three to four years. You know, maybe say, even to say two years of my life was spent learning Irish. Mm -hmm. Did we ever go outdoors once? No. How much Irish do I speak today? I mean, it's my own personal responsibility and fault, but it's very consistent across mm -hmm. the population. So I'm not, the fault is not the language. The fault is not the desire of people to learn a language. The fault at the time was the connection, uh, the assumption that education means meant sitting indoors with a desk in on your desk and being told what to repeat and told what to learn. And so there's a very traditional old school perspective that luckily is now being changed mm -hmm. and there's no possible fault of most of the teachers either because their hands were quite often tied as well with this is what you have to yeah they have to follow they the have program to follow this program so um i wanted to take a fairly extreme example to showcase actually what we're trying to do with outdoor education because there's mm -hmm. no reason that language is a perfect example couldn't be learned or taught 80 percent of the time outdoors Mm -hmm. You know, and experiencing what you're living you and breathing would, and would, would seeing outdoors. You'd learn much quicker. You'd learn quicker and you'd be teaching kids earlier. And right, lads, today we have to go back in because we're going to have to apply some of this on your notebooks. And, on, and you'd have people running to get back in and do a little bit of, you know. But it's it needs to be shifted the other way around. Mm. Rather than going out outdoors the odd time to learn mathematics, you know. I mean, hedge schools, the whole culture of... Uh, hedge schools at the time for bad reasons at mm -hmm. the time uh, obviously with around the sort of education um, uh, restrictions under British rule but you know hedge schools they were learning outdoors and probably learning just as effectively and possibly more so in mm -hmm. a much shorter time than the uh, than the kind of formal school yeah. uh, set up and so how do we learn outdoors and you know so there's a the, this is what we've been doing this last week in, weekend here in southwest Kerry with Evera Learning Landscapes and we've an amazing range of skills around um, teachers whether it's from the formal structure or people like um, John Fitz who are taking us outdoors to teach us about seaweed, um, mm. Niall Hogan talking us about wild foraging. Um, we had a, a couple of experts in one from speed, one from one from speed, Sweden specifically applying um, outdoor learning to the school curricula and how it fits and how teachers can, can do that. And so there's still a lot of challenges, but this notion of of outdoor education was something that I came back into contact with with the mm -hmm. with uh, the Canadian Wildlife Federation uh, and it's allowed me to you know I guess apply my specific skill which is in some ways uh, physical literacy to uh, to outdoor education and helping and f facilitating other educators to combine both of them yeah. and so that's a lot of what we've been doing this amazing weekend here in Waterville and uh, just from the sustainability standpoint, so in the last Volvo Ocean Race, I did a small bit of sailing, but a lot of the time my responsibility was to manage the sustainability program for the team. And, yeah. you know, so part of that actually was linking up with the Volvo Ocean Race education program, uh, whether it was through local schools, uh, whether it was through organizations that we would have worked with. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's a fantastic shift of perspective and it really puts value back into who we are, where we come from and this amazing resource that we have outdoors. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you're also involved in, in uh, uh, promoting best practice, uh, conservation, sustainability and also specifically, I think, around the uh, marine mammals when, when you're when you're when you uh, float and uh, and what's this what's why why marine mammals well, what's so I mean, special it's just an obviously very tangible um sort of indicator of what we see out there of ocean health or ocean issues and so here in ireland we got 24 marine mammals which is an amazing um quantity in fact uh we've got a very rich part of the ocean here in the eastern atlantic and um i say eastern atlantic but of course we're looking west so we're on kind mm -hmm. of west coast of ireland but you know mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> eastern atlantic, it's the eastern west atlantic. Coast. and um uh but having said that we do have a few vagrants as well so the bow-headed whale and arctic species came down to visit us oh, really? uh, the british isles a couple of uh, last year was that's, the, year that's the one that that inuits hunt the bow uh, yeah whale. and it's so it doesn't have a dorsal fin because it's evolved to mm -hmm. swim underneath ice, ice flows and this year they had um two belugas 
belugas, two adolescent belugas, I think up the wow. Thames mo most recently. So these are, it, they're unusual, but um, not... They were like, uh, were they like a lost and like, the, because the belugas Who are knows? like in the bigger... And yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, of course they're lost, so to speak, but you know, <laughs> you know they're, they're called vagrants, um, a species uh -huh. which is outside of its normal habitat range is, is, yeah. is called a vagrant. Yeah. And so whether that's a regular occurring event um, or whether it's something that's a one-off caused by individual mm -hmm. abnormalities mm -hmm. or population stress. The time or, will tell. Or, you know, you, you, you can never know from one, from one, uh, from one specific incident. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, uh, you know, vagrants can become precursors of... Um, of population displacement mm -hmm. as well, and so you know, if uh, if conditions change to the extent that the population starts to move, well, at some stage changes it like a home range. Yeah. Okay, and so what is it like specific activity that you're doing, like you're, prom prom you're promoting best practices for so, for absolutely. sailors? So for talking about marine mammals as opposed to sailing, you know, first of all, one of the things that we can do when we when we go out there is observe what we see and record that. So citizen science from a conservation standpoint is really valuable. Okay, so, so like a know, sighting a, recording, right? Exactly. So as a scientist you know if you're looking to know how many you know how many blue whales are in the north atlantic there's only so many that you and your scientific community can to, can can, mm -hmm. can, uh, can record but if you if you can access the citizen population to record um, their sightings, uh, you know, that's hugely valuable. So citizen science, mm -hmm. there's multiple platforms for accumulating that data. And so those type of sightings, we try to record and send through. And then there are other obvious ones around just best practices. What's the, you know, and promoting best practices, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's uh, as a whale watching vessel, marine mammal watching vessel, how close can you go? What sort of, what sort of things you should do in the proximity mm -hmm. of marine mammals. And, then with regards to mitigation for our own events, because the challenge here is these boats that we're sailing are going faster and faster. Um, the average, some of the, some, some whale species out there, like the northern right whale, are a very slow moving animal, typically two to three to four knots. Uh, a lot of the time, there these mammals are spending time on the surface for feeding, sleeping, or whatever. Okay, and, I know uh, where it's where, where this probably is going. Probably not for feeding, generally for for sleeping. And so there's a lot. There are collisions, and so there is a formal. The IWC, the International Whaling Wait. Commission, has a formal protocol for reporting and recording um, collisions and incidents at sea with with, with marine mammals. And so oh. there's an unawareness, a lack of awareness within the sailing community. Um, about that protocol and so that's something that oh. we integrate and so first of all we need to design our events to avoid uh, sensitive areas and areas of high population or importance and one of the best examples is off Boston and Nantucket there's a very specific zone around the Nantucket Shoals which is a, a very important part of the northern right whale population which mm -hmm. is the, one of the most endangered, endangered marine mammals in the world and so there's a whole exclusion zone that shipping is not allowed to go into so when we design our events we have to respect those yes. exclusion zones but we can also include ones which are lesser known but also just as important yes. and, and I have been involved with those sort of programs and then um, you know being aware obviously that uh, you know if we do have an incident that we report it and a lot of the time those type of incidents we we, we, we hap happen aren't always with marine mammals there's other stuff out there as well basking sharks mm -hmm. uh, sunfish Jeez, sunfish are they're one of the most dense uh, I say dense in terms of weight yes. versus volume, but yes. I also say yes. dense because they're really slow moving species. Yes. They're very big. I've seen a, an old black and white photo of a sunfish that was the size of a car floating off uh, southern Brazil and that a, a fisherman was standing on. So, wow. you know, but even a small one, the size of this table here in front of me, if you hit that going any sort of speed, you could rip the keel out of the bottom of the boat. Yes. Um, and so, you know, and then there's other um, non-living debris out there as well, containers, plastic. Yeah, yeah. And so all of these things are an issue. And unfortunately, in some ways, you know, you know, or, you know, unfortunately, as the boats get faster and faster, it's getting harder and harder for us to detect what's ahead of us and for mm -hmm. what's in the water to detect us coming. Uh, and so especially if you smell slow moving whale. Uh, absolutely. So, you know, these are, you know, these are issues that we cannot ignore. We have to. Yeah. Um, you know, there's various in North America. America, there's very specific uh, protocol as to what you ha what you do, what you have to do if you mm -hmm. hit a deer or a moose, you know, yeah. and you have to call nine one one, and you're not supposed to put it in the back of your pickup, and uh, it, it comes in, you know, the 
um, the road services come and get it, uh, or wildlife services come to pick it up. Mm -hmm. uh, at sea, there's a kind of a, a culture of being the ostrich a little bit, mm -hmm. putting your head in the sand and ignoring it and pretending mm -hmm. it didn't happen, uh, <laughs> which is wrong. You know, we need to acknowledge um, what happens out in the water. and Even from the perspective that whale was there. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, and, you know, so a lot of the time it's no one's fault. But, yeah. you know, we need to, okay, be honest about it. You know, why did that happen? And maybe how can we avoid it in the future? Otherwise, there's no yeah, improvement to yeah. be had. So. I'm surprised what you said that, that you're, you're, is it in Canada that you're supposed to report that you hit yeah, the no, deer? Yeah, North America. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. I yeah. thought that like in North America, you just put the, like I said, put it in the back. No, no, no. That would, that would it be probably weird. varies from state to state. Um, right? No, I mean, it's it's separate okay. from hunting or anything like that. You know, road, uh, road kill. Is oh, like a, like a road. Okay, that's interesting. Anyway, uh, listen, one last one last question. Um, subject is very, you know, quite close to my heart. What's your thoughts on overfishing? Is there a way of of preventing and stopping that or is it just a matter that we gonna get the situation so bad that the whole sector of economy basically you know becomes to not not render any profits and that's when the overfishing will stop when it's gonna be too late well i mean i think there's all of that um this subject is way is we'll have to talk about this either on another uh, um, article well, i'm, I'm well, keen to go on that but i'm not in any way an expert. On me. <laughs> i'm not in any way an expert on this issue but i do um i um um, uh, I do have one specific, um, you know, having spoken to a lot of conservationists and read a lot about this subject and being from a, a marine community, uh, one thing that I can say is, is um, uh, the, you know, the, the reference ec experts who uh, are studying this issue, one of the, the key thing to maintaining healthy um, marine populations are marine protected areas. And mm -hmm. this is one of the sing this is the single most important action that local, regional, national, and international organizations and governments need to be looking at are marine protected areas, uh, um, special areas of conservation, and the way that they're applied. And so the benefit of a marine protected area is multiple. Not only is it protecting that specific area for um, for you know the full duration of the year mm -hmm. or years, uh, but actually any you know uh, you know it, it protects that breeding ground as well, and any you know any overspill uh, goes well beyond the border the borders of the MPA, yeah. and so that you know wherever MPAs have been um, have been created, there's been uh, exponential increase in fishing and and fish outside and sorry of fish outside of the mpas which more than compensates for the peace that's been put aside and yeah. so oh really ab absolutely so okay. singularly just around overfishing that is the most important thing now we we really do need to address this in ireland because we've got a really important piece of ocean here in the eastern atlantic yes. and we're also responsible for putting some of the you know uh, despite the fact that um, uh, we have a small fishing fleet um, uh, you know, some of the vessels that Ireland has put in the uh, on the water and may even if they're no longer Irish flagged are, you know, one of the vessels out there is one of the biggest fishing fleets, uh, one of the biggest the factory Ma Marguerite. fishing uh, boats on the, on, on the yeah. water. And so that's not at all aligned with... Um, with, uh, it's the biggest super trawler in the world. With, with marine conservation, and um, yeah. doesn't make any sense at all. But that's a that's a different subject. But yeah. the single most important solution are marine protected areas, and you know we have a huge role to play here in Ireland, and it will assist and aid the um, the local fishing community. And uh, but you know obviously there's a lot of issues around deciding where and how. Uh, they are created and applied, and who can fish inside yeah. them, and where they're created. But they are, um, they are, you know, they're really proven as being the single most effective and important thing. And I think there's only a small percentage of the world oceans which are con currently um, mm -hmm. legislated as MPAs, and there's um, a big push now to increase that percentage to something which will actually really make a difference. Perfect. Um, Damien, thank you very much for that. Uh, any any concluding thoughts for our listeners? Any message? No, well, you know, just it, it is wonderful to be back home here and looking out over the... We've got, a, I think it's a Sunday here today. We've got a final... Uh, event tomorrow from the Ivra Learning Landscapes. We're going to take the community out for some, uh, so for, so for some physical literacy this time. We're going to be paddling across Loch, Loch Caron up into Glenmore before the, joining the Kerry Way and a hike over the Windy Cap. 
uh, into Cahar Daniel. So it's a full day adventure uh, with a pint and a bit of dinner there in the in the Blind Piper in Cahar Daniel before uh, before we come back uh, back here to Waterville. So that's what's on the cards for tomorrow. Uh, where you know this is Sea Synergy Marine Awareness and Activity Centre. So we run a full range of programs down here in Southwest Kerry education, conservation, and getting people connected with the outdoors. So come and, come and join us. Thanks again. Thank you. And that was another episode of Tommy's Outdoors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Outdoors Podcast. Like us on Facebook at Tommy's Outdoors. Follow us on Instagram at Tommy's Outdoors. And also, don't forget to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yes, people, YouTube channel. Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel. Uh, and obviously, subscribe on any and all podcasting platforms to so never miss an episode again. And uh, that's it. Until the next time, bye-bye.